Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, he's back. He's back, baby. Lewis O'Connor, founder and principal of Strategic Meadows Invest. And if you're not familiar with uh, my first podcast with Lewis, we talked about all the the, the benefits of investing in these these uh, these rare earths um, and and some of the interesting facts about it, but I don't want to go too too off track on this intro because the Strategic Metals Invest is the only industry supplier in the world, the only industry supplier in the world to offer private investors the option to purchase and profit from owning strategic metals, and the investment plays exactly the same paradigm as investing in precious metals. Instead, the investor is purchasing strategic metals. And as we talked about in our first podcast, strategic metals have outperformed gold by 58%, the FTSE 100, 3%, and S&P 500 by 112% consistently for the past five years with a 175% average return for the same period. Lewis, welcome. Mark, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here with you again. Our, our prophecies came through <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that prophecy because it's it was really interesting. The first time we were talking, we were talking about the 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 possibility that China could actually use their their basically monopoly on on these rare earth uh, metals and mm-hmm. and weaponize them and. This is what about a year ago we were talking about this. Is that right? Yeah, it's just under a year. I think it's eleven months, Mark. And um, you know, we were, you know, you're talking about sort of geopolitics here, and you you know, people would think, well, what do these guys know? But the truth is, I mean, you know, I'm in the metals industry. China has a monopoly, and we sort of saw this coming. Um, the big surprise is that sort of Europe and even and the US have sort of been caught a little bit off guard. And just to give you a brief sort of, um, I'll just cover briefly what we had we talked about it, which is when we talk about strategic metals, they all sort of come under the same umbrella. So precious metals, strategic metals, they really are the same umbrella. But just to give you a simple explanation, so in one smartphone, there's 12 of these strategic metals. And two of them are gold and silver, and everybody knows about gold and silver, right? But the other 10, you can also own as physical assets. And like Indium, for example, you can't swipe your phone without Indium. Or, you know, alternatively, there's a small magnet in the speaker. Well, the same raw materials that are in that magnet are used in magnets for electric cars, for solar, for wind. So I suppose to cut a long story short, we're talking about 10 metals that are critical to all nations' economic prosperity and also increasingly military capabilities. So they're essentially the backbone of manufacturing in the 21st century. And then what people probably wouldn't know is that of those, of that 10, seven of those are, China completely dominates the supply. Like one of the ones we talk about today, gallium, for example, China supplies 98% of the world's gallium. And they've just restricted the export of gallium to the US, to Japan, and to Holland. It's a sort of a, there's a bit of a, there's trade tensions and the stuff is escalating. But, you know, essentially, this is not good news for, for you know, for the rest of the world. Um, it only happened once before. In 2011, there was a spat between uh, China and Japan. Um, over fishing, you know, in disputed waters, and the Japanese actually detained a Chinese captain of the trawler. And in response, China restricted the export of these metals to Japan, and we saw prices, you know, five x like in a in a few months, you know. So, so for that to ha- it hasn't happened in a decade. For China to be things are escalating as we get into more detail. I mean, tensions are sort of manifest and escalating. Yeah, I mean, two weeks ago you were just on CNBC, and there was a, a four minute interview with you, and and by the way, congratulations for finally being on a prestigious type of media, like the Art of Passive Income <laughs> podcast. 
instead of CNBC. <laughs> but uh, so you're you're breaking it down for them, and, and you were surprised by how little they even knew about this. Yeah, well, um, well, I suppose the biggest surprise to me, and this same, you know, in Europe and, and the US, is that I think what's happened, Mark, is we've just woken up to the fact that for the last two or three decades, the world were sort of high, if you will, on the globalization drug. And we either right. forgot or didn't think it's probably not a good idea to let one country monopolize a raw material that's critical to all nations' economic prosperity. And that's sort of what, you know, because back in the 80s, the U.S. were producing the most uh, of these strategic metals. They're, they're also known as technology metals and rare earth elements, but but essentially they're they're critical, you know, to, to manufacturing in the 21st century. And what happened in the late, in the late 80s is um, China sort of legitimately, in front of everybody, moved all the processing um, to China. And at the time, the U.S. government said, well, look, China can do, it's a bit complicated because rare earths are, they don't occur naturally like base metals. They have to be extracted, se uh, separated and refined. So it's sort of a messy process. And right. the U.S. government and Europe said, well, you know, we let the Chinese do it for a lot less money than we can. And we we'll just buy these materials cheaply for our manufacturing. That was globalization, right? Well, that's completely backfired now. And, you know, gallium and indium and praseodymium, some of the some of the seven that China dominate. I mean, without right. them is is germanium you know, in that as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um gallium, germanium, indium, praseodymium, neodymium, uh, dysprosium, and terbium. So there's ten altogether, but there's seven that China you know, for example, have complete dominance, meaning um, 90% or more production comes from China. Okay, so given this new economic reality, and you had predicted it a year ago, if I had invested in these rare earth metals with you through strategicmetalsinvest.com, uh, what would my return have been? Um. Depending on 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 which metal, right? Um, like right. half moon, for example, in the last year went up, I think, one hundred and ninety percent. Terbium's up five hundred percent in three years. Um, but we did have some of the prices slide earlier this year for some of the rare earth elements because, um, th like, things sort of slowed down as well in China, as, as people would be aware of, and also. Um, some of the the goals for electric cars weren't met. Um, you know, we can build them, but with the infrastructure is not there. So, so not all the metals um, went up in value in the last year. But you know, we always recommend people sort of diversify and buy all ten metals, and that way you're you're invested in you know energy transition, aviation, space industry, um all modern technology, medical. I suppose it's easier to say there's not an industry that you're not invested in, you know. Yeah. Um, so we've had sort of some of them go down, but since about June, July, prices are are rising again. And this this ban or this, this restriction that China introduced just took effect August the 1st. So we're only about um, six weeks into it. And it's yet to be seen exactly how that will play out i mean i can tell you the prices are rising because you know corporations are, are stockpiling and countries are even you know what's happening is even the other five metals that china could also restrict um you know this demand is increasing because companies and nations are realizing okay we probably need to stockpile because we don't know what the outcome is going to be so either way yeah you know products that were already in huge demand that the demand is increasing just sort of for stockpiling alone, you know? Yeah, I mean, what is the the counter to China's weaponizing rare earth metals? Where does the rest of the world say, okay, you can do that, but we're now we're going to hurt you economically in this way? Yeah, well, China's move uh, is a is a it's in it's a response to the U.S. initiated a block on the most advanced uh, computer chip technology getting to China. 
and the U.S. was backed by Japan and Holland because obviously a lot of the this technology has dual uses, you know, civilian and military. So you know, it's a strategic G, um, um, security move on behalf of the U.S. But what's interesting about that is um, the West, you could say, has the technology, but China has the raw materials. Right. So despite the name, like some of these are called rare earth elements, they're not all that rare. And if you look at in the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act, which despite the name is all about energy transition, there's about $390 billion available in to support and, and subsidize the rare earth, the, the strategic metal industry. Because the U.S. and Europe have realized they have to wean their dependence off China. But, you know, it's not an overnight matter, Mark. You know, one of, one of the most important things that I think politicians maybe aren't saying or don't know, because, you know, they wouldn't know much about sort of energy economics or supply chain, you know, reserves and economics. And something they probably, I don't know, don't know or don't want to say is that it took China 30 years to, you know, to get into this position. And during that last 30 years, I'll give you some context. China has, I think, 39 universities uh, graduating degrees in critical minerals, in metallurgy, in geology, in met metallurgic engineering. So the Chinese have been graduating about 200 metallurgists a week, every week for the last 30 years. Wow. Europe, none. The US, maybe a handful of universities are graduating degrees in critical minerals. So, um, you know, I, I, the, the estimate is there's about 300,000 metallurgists in China. There may be 400 in the US, zero in Europe, because we're not doing any. So that's, you know, that's more the issue is even though there may be rare earths in Sweden and there may be the probably rare earths in, in, in the US, it's getting them from the ground to refined purity levels that you can put into an F-35 fighter jet or an Apple computer. That's going to take 15, 20 years, you know? Wow. So this is an exciting opportunity as an investor. It's also a scary time for the for the Western world when yeah. uh, the prices are going to skyrocket and that's going to affect, we were already in an inflationary environment, but our cars or computers are everything's going to go up in in price uh i would imagine if if we pull that string they are rising you know and you know on top of all that mark um even if we didn't have this geopolitical tension um many experts you know who know far more than i do um and where are to be in the industry far longer would, would have told me and would tell you that even without this sort of tension um there's not enough of these raw materials to transition to you know you know for example i'll give you one small example austria one small country in europe nine million people in order for them to meet their um green energy goals or their low carbon economy say by 2030 they would need currently they would between now and 2030 they'd need the, the, the entire global supply of gallium just for that one country and gallium is 98% produced in China, and China needs plenty of gallium for their own transition. China has huge plans for uh, electric cars, solar, and wind power. You know, another thing people might not be aware of is, is China will produce 9 million electric cars this year. It'll be the largest producer of electric cars. And their goal now is, now that they've achieved dominance, that they have the raw materials needed, their goal now is to move up the supply chain not supply the raw materials to the world, supply the products, the electric cars, the solar panels, and the wind turbines. So, right. you know, it's there's a few dynamics involved. You know, you're right, it's it's not good news, but purely from, from my business perspective, for, as an investor, this is good news for people who hold these raw materials as, uh, as physical assets. Well, let, let's talk about it from the investment standpoint. So if you are, first of all, do you have to be an accredited investor to no. make these investments? No, okay. no. Minimum investment is just $10,000 to begin. Okay. So you got $10,000 and you you go to strategicmetalsinvest.com. What, what's the next step? 
Um, some, you know, a lot of people get sort of some education themselves. Um, they already might like an industry. I mean, most people who are investing are discerning enough that they they learn a good bit themselves beforehand. So someone might come to me and say, "What metals are needed in electric cars?" and and they might want to focus on that or energy transition or aviation, for example. Um, the space exploration is becoming a fully fledged space industry. So raw materials needed in in the in the engines for rockets and and jet engines are, are would be the same. So there's you know people are sort of aware of certain industries. So they could pick one metal, or they could focus on one industry, or they could just say, look, I'd rather have an even spread of of the the entire range, which would be ten. There'd be four technology metals or sorry, six technology metals and four were earth elements. And if you bought sort of one kilo of each of them, which wouldn't be much more than $10,000, then you'd be invested in, there's not an industry you wouldn't have a stake in because essentially you're buying the raw materials, the upstream raw materials, I should say, that ultimately become trillions of dollars in downstream GDP. So you're there's not a sector you're not invested in if you bought if you diversify to buy all 10. Okay, so I diversify, I buy all 10. And then what do I get to show that I own these 10 metals? Sure. And then where's my liquidity event when the prices go up in value? Hopefully? Okay, so um, the chain of custody of these raw materials is very important. Um, the purchase itself is very much like, it's, it's the same paradigm as buying gold or silver. You You physically own the asset. It's not you know, a piece of paper. However, we, we're we based in Europe. We have our own storage facility in Europe. And, you know, we couldn't recommend more strongly you store them in our storage facility. And the reason for that is that it's important that they remain in the original packaging from the producer and that the chain of custody remains intact because we also will offer to liquidate them for you. We can mediate a sale to an industry buyer. I suppose I should preface that, Mark, with probably the most important thing you need to know about is I'm not, this is not just a sales and marketing company. Our core business is we're an industry supplier of these raw materials. So, you know, 80% of our business activities are buying directly from producers, mostly in China, and then we resell to industry buyers. We have over 2,000 buyers in 70 different countries worldwide. If that wasn't our core business, it wouldn't be safe to even talk about what I'm talking about, the, the, the private investor. You could say, as you guys in America like to say, um, the private investment side is our, our side hustle, um, our right. side business. But we couldn't have this side business if our core business, you know, we. Oh, I, I'd like to say if we weren't linked to the industry, but you have to be in this industry in order to be able to to take advantage of it, you know? So essentially what we do is we invite private investors to participate in, in the supply chain industry because that's primarily what we do. So we do recommend you store in our facility for ease of liquidation. Now, you know, you own the metals, you could move them, but the thing is if you move them, you've broken the chain of custody. So when you come back to us in five years, you know, they'd need to be retested or so we could, we really, really suggest you store them with us, but they're your metals. You can come over and see them and feel them and touch them and, and visit the vault, you know. But um, once they're there, they're, they're in the custody of a recognized industry supplier, even though they're in your name. They're, you get a, um, a proper, you know, commercial invoice and you get a safekeeping receipt from the vault to show this is what's allocated to you. And so, you know, you've got batch numbers and purity levels. So you do own the raw materials, but we just for chain of custody, re recommend you store with us. And um, we recommend three to five years, um, but you know they can be sort of volatile in the short term. I mean, we had one metal go up, you know, 180% last year alone. Um, we had some metals go down. So we, we recommend, you know, if you wanna make some, you know, comfortable gains is be in there for three to five years. Three, okay, so three to five years, and I said, okay, I'm ready to sell my my gallium. Yes. And then you would say, okay, no problem. Here's XYZ company that needs to buy your gallium. We'll make an offer right away. Yeah, you'd receive an offer, an official offer 
And if you accept that offer, it'll be current market prices. And if you accept that offer, then we send you a sales contract, you sign it. So the transaction could complete in three to four working days and funds would be sent within 10 days of, of the closing date. So in actual fact, there it's very easy um, to purchase and to resell. You know, the transaction can close, the purchasing can take place within a week if you want, and the sale within a week as well. Um, okay. As an industry supplier, you know, we don't want any un- uncomfortable situations with private investors or primary businesses is, you know, buying and selling. So we make, you know, we take those responsibilities very seriously, you know. Yeah. What's the biggest risk to the investor in this process? Okay. So, um, I mean, in terms of the business, the company itself, it's as safe as any business can be. I mean, we're almost 25 years of business. We're sort of very, very well known worldwide as being, you know, we've held an ISO 9001 Quality, ish, quality management certificate consistently since 2003. So, you know, we our product is is increasing in demand and, you know, supply is limited. So that side of it is, is about as safe as any business can be. So what you'd want to watch out for is, for example, I mentioned Indium. Um, you can't swipe your phone without Indium. Maybe somebody will come, on, come along with a better technology. Um, also... China does completely monopolize, so they can, you know, they can restrict or allow as much as they please. I mean, so the reason some of the prices dropped this year is, um, you know, because of the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. and the Critical Minerals Act in Europe, and um, China wanted to discourage. I mean, there's billions of dollars available in the U.S. to get into this industry, but the Chinese allowed right. some of the prices to drop pretty much down to cost. Because it didn't make sense. Nobody's going to invest ten million in a in a mining company if there's not going to be any profit. So, so you know, it's not a very transparent industry. It's opaque. Political landscape is increasingly playing a part. But at least the bottom line for me, anyway. I mean, I'm an investor first and foremost. Is it's the demand? Nobody would argue. Not even the mother. My mother in law would argue that. Um, you know, the demand for these raw materials is going to decrease. It's just not going to happen. It's going to continue to increase. And we know at least with seven of these raw materials, China, um, you know, has that dominance. So, so yeah, you know, the, one of the te- technologies could be su- substituted is what I would say. And um, there could be, at some point, there could be, you know, more supply, you know. But what I would say is they all have multiple applications. So, you know, and there's new technologies being used all the time. I mean, the next generation solar panels and medical devices are all using these these raw materials, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the U.S. government uses their tax code as an incentive to get people to do what they want them to do. And right now, the U.S. government wants the taxpayers to invest in energy. And in exchange for investing in energy, you get this massive tax deduction. Would the Correct. same apply for rare earth metals? Hundred percent, hundred percent. They are they're listed as critical. If you look at the U.S. A geological Survey, and there's an annual report, or maybe every two years, the most recent one just came out, and seven of our metals are listed on that report as critical to the U to U.S. national security as well as economic prosperity. Um, the U.S. is even sort of encouraging or subsidizing somehow education so people can get these degrees in credit. And so they need geologists as well. Uh, U.S. Department of Defense signed with a, the largest producer outside of China is Linus Corp in Australia. I believe they're going to set up a processing facility in either Texas or Florida just for the U.S. Department of Defense. So basically, I mean, the U.S. and Europe I mean, I mentioned in the U.S. a lot because I know your audience is, is North American, but but they've woken up to the fact that we have to wean our dependence off China. No matter. The, so there's a lot of collaboration now between other countries and, you know, Chile sort of produces some and, you know, Africa, but also China's already in Africa. So you will see more production. But again, the human capital, the engineering expertise does not exist in Europe and it does not exist at the moment in the U.S. So either way, the next sort of five or 10 years will be interesting 
for investors. Yeah, absolutely. But if I invest that ten thousand dollars, do I get bonus depreciation on that ten thousand dollars? Are are you aware of what happens with the U.S. tax code in that situation? No, no, you wouldn't want to take tax advice from an Irishman, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, but it's so, it's worth it's worth looking into though. Yeah, what I can tell you, tax wise in Europe anyway, is if you own the, the raw materials for a minimum of you store them a minimum of a year. There's no taxes, um, you know, in Europe anyway, because you um, the vault is a zone larger, so it's a duty free zone. So although the vault it's it's in Frankfurt, it's right, it couldn't be more central Europe. Frankfurt is yeah. the center of Europe, and if you um, although they're sitting there, they technically haven't entered Europe from a tax perspective. So if you keep them a year, you don't pay any tax on on purchasing or selling, but obviously then. You know, Uncle Sam has global taxation. So does Australia. So you have to, you know, when you do your report, you have to report your gains. But other than that, okay. I don't know anymore. Okay, so that that would be worth looking into for sure. Liz, is there anything I should have asked you? I didn't ask you. This is such a uh, a fascinating in, you know, um, industry and area of investment. Yeah, no, I think we covered it very well. I mean, the, yeah, we pretty much, I mean, the easiest way to think of it is there's 12, you know, of these raw materials in your phone. They're also in all other um, industries. And you know gold and silver. The other 10 are the ones we're talking about that are a relatively new asset class. You can physically own them much the same as you would gold or silver. That's that's it. It's It's quite simple, really. Okay, great, great. Well, Lewis, again, thank you so much for for coming back and and you know really sounding the alarm on, on this. And as you know, passive investors, this you know sounds like an amazing opportunity. At least even a diversification play. I mean, with a minimum of only ten thousand dollars, I can't see why everyone wouldn't want to uh, you know dip their their toe in the the rare earth metals pond. Yeah. And, well, as we said, yeah. Mark, a year, like less than a year ago, we, we talked about supply demand and we, we predicted more or less that China could weaponize economically rare earths. And that's exactly what happened. It's so far as from the CNBC interview, you'll see that China's restricting gallium and germanium. But we already know China has plans to restrict the other five. Um, apparently... Biden and the Chinese premier will meet in November. And I would imagine if things, you know, it depends on how things go between now and then. But, but China has just basically fired a warning shot across the belt to saying, look, we we control these raw materials. You need them. We're willing to restrict them. And, you know, your move, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, may, may we live in interesting times. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we're at that point now. The podcast, Lewis, where I'm going to ask you for you know a little bit more information or advice, your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? I'm going to steal something from somebody I recently spoke to, um, which is do sweat the small stuff. And what I mean by that is this guy and his company – has a buzzword, 1%, and everybody is always talking about 1%. And, and the idea behind it is, you know, in, in your daily life, from as soon as you wake up until uh, you go to bed, and that could be spiritual practice as well as, you know, time with the family and exercise and businesses, try and do 1% better than yesterday. So do sweat that little extra bit of effort. And I guess it's similar to that compound interest type of thing, you know, if you if you aim to improve by you know little in those little small things, and um, over time, then it 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 should produce a you know a, a better result. Yeah, I you know there's a, a book that's it has been the the best selling book I think the last five years is James Clear's Atomic Habits, and that's okay. really what it's about is the value of of taking something very very small and compounding it over time, and it becomes you know, a, a, a huge gain in your life. And we can do that with, with anything. And there's, there's science, you know, to it. I mean, basically all you're doing is Newton's law. 
right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. the object in motion tends to stay in motion. So even if I just say, okay, I'm not going to work out for 30 minutes this morning. That's too much. But I could do one push-up, right? Yeah. Well, you end up like, okay, that one push-up wasn't so bad. What if I do five? Well, that wasn't so bad. And next thing you know, you <laughs> yeah. you you're you're you had a ten minute workout, and you're like, okay, that that wasn't so bad, and it, it increases over time as you get stronger, yeah. and you can apply that to everything in your life, and uh, that's a great tip of the week. But that yeah, tip of I the think, week, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Lewis. I think the important thing as well is to try and include a review every day. You know, at the end of the day, just sort of play the tape of the day, and that's when you can spot where you, you could apply that 1%. And, and I think just it's how our brains work is if we continually, you know, um, send that message, we just start to pick things up, you know, um, neur- neural neuroplasticity and stuff. So it's sort of like all good ideas, very, very simple stuff if you just put it into action, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've started a, a journaling habit and, and I've actually done it, the atomic habit of it. I would just say, okay, I'll write for one minute. And then, I'll, of course, I'll write for longer. But for you know, if I was gonna say, Oh, I'm gonna write for three pages, it would and it's late at night, I'm tired, I'm not gonna do it, I'll just skip it. But anybody can write for one minute, or mm-hmm. you know, I could just write one sentence, even. <laughs> and and then next thing you know, I've written and I've I've been able to review my day and and see where I was productive, where I could have been more productive, even rate the day. Uh yeah. so that's a great idea. Well, as great as these as I, these ideas are, Lewis, they're not going to make us any money. But my idea will. Go to strategicmetalsinvest.com. That is my tip of the week. Strategicmetalsinvest.com. We'll have a link to it. We should have a link to uh, Lewis's uh, interview with CNBC as well. And uh, to give you even more information. And, you know, not to get too off topic, but we do want to talk at some point about uh, truffles and uh, investors being able to invest in truffles. So I have to have you back. I'd love to. Yeah, that definitely before the end of the year, um, we have a truffle farm here in Tipperary and we opening it up to, we have opened it up to private investors, a sort of a limited amount every year. And I'd love to come back before the end of the year and, and talk about that Mark. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I love truffle oil on some French fries. A little pasta with truffles. Expensive Fantastic. taste. Huh? <laughs> what's what's that? Expensive taste, exactly. Uh, what, is there other other uses for truffles? Oh yeah, oh yeah. In the culinary world, they're known as well. The black Mediterranean truffle is known as the black diamond. I mean, they're very very expensive, and you yeah. know they're they're a delicacy. They yeah, there are multiple multiple uses um, in the culinary world, but obviously top dollar. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll have to talk more about that as well. I want to thank the listeners, remind you, the only way I'm going to get Lewis O'Connor back is if he looks at the podcast and says, oh yeah, there's more great reviews. So please follow, rate, review the podcast, send a screenshot of that of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. But if you don't want the book or if you have the book, just do it selfishly so we get... Uh, great guests like Lewis O'Connor uh, to come or, or come back. All right. Lewis, thanks again. And let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.